Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video. This is a Ukraine war update news segment for the 14th of February 2023, Valentine's Day. So don't forget, you know, you if you have a partner in your life, it's not just about the Ukraine war and watching me bang on about stuff. But before you give them a rose or whatever, check this out. Loads of news today, absolutely tons. Uh, I'll try and rush through it. So we'll go, as ever, first to the figures that the Ukrainians have released for the Russian losses the day before. Usual caveats, inaccurate propaganda, um, and the Russians don't produce the same figures. However, the more I do this, the more I think these are accurate, and I've been giving you evidence every day as to why I think the, these are, are more accurate than not, uh, particularly in the equipment lost, and the figures for personnel lost are certainly indicative. Anyway... We've had an uptick from the day before. I said yesterday's might have been because it was uh, based on Sunday stats. We've got a 740, which is you know well above average and towards what we were seeing over the last week. We've got three tanks, eight APCs, nine artillery systems, one MLRS, uh, two aircraft. In fact, that may actually be three now. There's reports that three were taken down yesterday. Uh, four drones, five vehicles, and one piece of special equipment. Aircraft is obviously very significant. Uh, one of those is a Su-24 that Wagner have admitted uh, was, was taken down one of their own fixed-wing aircraft. So that, that's definitely at least one. That's as according to Russian sources. Uh, let's go and kind of piece together some of the, some of these claims. So the uh, BBC Russia that, that has already produced rather like Oryx, its own uh, visual confirmation statistics for Russian losses by uh, looking over social media over the entire length of the war. And they've done this with... Uh, Medusa, I think, uh, a Russian exiled news outlet. And they have um, looked at uh, evidence of funerals for l lost you know, Russian personnel and piecing together all the, all the claims that people have died all over the internet from Russian sources uh, and given a bare minimum, rather like Oryx, of like, this is at least how many Russians have died. So you, uh, when I discuss Russian loss statistics explicitly, I, I often dip into what they, they've claimed. Anyway, they've uh, shown that there's they've proven a massive hike in newly mobilised civilians dying in the war. So these are mobilised death. While almost 1,100 deaths have been found to be publicly announced on social media, 40% of them have been since January. So these are just that, again, this is your bare minimum and there's been a real hike since January. So when we are talking about uptick in losses here, right, and pro-Russians come on my threads and say, well, you don't know what you talk about, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you say, actually, let's piece together what we see from video evidence. Let's piece together what we see from troop movement. Let's piece together what we see from Russian sources and ultra-nationalist bloggers saying the same. And all these bits of evidence, you piece it together like a jigsaw, and these figures end up being accurate. And another piece of the jigsaw here is what the BBC have found, which is a big uptick since January of deaths. Okay, uh, then we have uh, in the Vukladar direction, again, this is from, um, uh, I think, Russian sources as well, saying a commander has been taken out in a HIMARS strike, LD uh, LDNR uh, command post hit by HIMARS, and a commander was killed. Um, so the, as I say, this is coming from uh, Alexander Kodad, uh, Kolokovsky. Uh, and then you and then you put together other bits of jigsaw, which is this is a fourth one of these videos that's come out this week, pretty much fourth in four days, I think maybe, where you've got another group of mobilized soldiers, Russians, complaining. So these guys, I won't play your whole thing, are claiming they're supposed to be territorial defense. They were then had their military IDs taken off them and they were stamped with a DPR. Uh, stamps. So they were basically assimilated into DPR. I was saying recently that, that it looks like DPR is being assimilated into the Russian armed forces, but that's obviously not the case um, completely, or there's all sorts of different things going on. And these guys have been kind of, their military ID has been got rid of, they're now DPR and have been sent in as shock troops, uh, which again, this is kind of that kind of language fits into the doctrine I was talking about yesterday in terms of deep battle. But I don't know whether that's definitely the case. Shock troops can be used in different contexts, but they're, they're saying we don't know what's going on. You know, we're, we're trying to complain here because there's just no way we can complain to anyone. We don't even know who the names of our commanders are. We know one of their call signs, but we don't know their surnames or anything. And it's just like, you know, we are, we are being 
sent to the front and we don't have the equipment and etc cetera, etc cetera. the usual stuff that we've heard but it's just at some point if you're pro russian you've got to start thinking something is up here because there is just so much of this evidence coming out um yeah uh the, so wagner owned su24 shot down that's um that's come from russian sources before it came from the general staff uh, so russian forces saying that and now i think wagner have have admitted one of theirs has been shot down and um two su 24ms and one su 25 jet the general staff said this morning so that's after those compiled statistics have come out saying only two jets taken down actually it looks like three that's a huge loss and it goes back to what i was saying yesterday in my extra video big analysis of the offensive yesterday talking about how they the russians had adapted to be more conservative with their air force to use them in in a very cautious manner behind their own lines but since they've switched back to this offensive posture and since Gerasimov has come in, we've started seeing jets getting shot down really often, particularly over the Bakhmut area, where over the last week you've had, what, that must be six over the last week, and the week before was um, maybe including helicopters approaching to double figures or some, somewhere around it. Really big uptick in, in aircraft losses as they appear to be taking far more risk and going back to the kind of activity they were doing at the beginning of the war when they lost a load and it was just completely unsustainable. Well, it, it seems to be they, they've gone back to that that mode of thinking, possibly based on Gerasimov and their offensive um, posturing. I'm not going to show you this, but again, it's trying to fit, uh, it's, try, it's trying to see what evidence supports these kind of figures. This is an incredible bit of footage, incredible bad. Uh, th this is possibly, uh, so under the tree, it's somewhere between 20 and 30 Russian personnel here, and you've got others around. And basically, uh, a, a big piece of ordnance, something lands literally right in the middle of them. It's a big old piece of ordnance, and all of these guys get blown up. Uh, it's, it's a pretty horrific bit of footage. But the point of me mentioning that it's not kind of glorifying this this violence, but again, it's evidence to support. So if you've got pretty much 30 people here in in just one strike taken out, right? 30 people, and there's visual evidence of that happening, then you go back to this and you say, right, can can I is this is this a plausible number? Is this a feasible number? Well, when we start when we're seeing all these bits of information coming in, you think, yep, it really is a plausible number. Um, and I'm also starting to see an uptick in video footage of howitzers being taken out. Here's another two howitzers, pretty old howitzers, no doubt, D20s, um, on the left bank of the Dnieper. So it's not only we're starting to see more howitzers taken out, and this is being reflected in an uptick of artillery systems uh, that I think we've seen over the last week, possibly two weeks, but... Also, a lot of these seem to be around the Kherson area. The Kherson has been under a lot of pressure from uh, artillery on the, on the left bank, or sorry, on the right bank of the Dnipro River, the Kherson is, being hit by artillery on the left bank, that I think there might well be a concerted effort to take out um, both MLRS systems and artillery systems around the Kherson area. It just seems like this is this is a targeted attempt. Um uh, hashtag ATP007, uh, British intelligence, basically saying what I've been saying over the last couple of days. I swear they watch these videos. Uh, obviously not. Um, in the last few days, Wagner Group forces have almost certainly made further small gains around the northern outskirts of contested Donbass town of Bakhmut. Yep, yep, yep. All that's pretty normal. Uh, in the north, in Kremlis Fatva sector of Luhansk, Russian forces are making continuous offensive efforts, though each local attack remains on a too smaller scale to achieve a significant breakthrough. Remember what I was talking about yesterday about um, spreading their offensive capabilities or capacity out over the whole front line to try and find these uh, weak spots. And then when they find a weak spot, they go for a, if they're using the deep battle tactics, they then go to try and sort of flood that, that weak point. Russia likely aims to reverse some of the gains Ukrainian forces made over September, November 22. Uh, there is a realistic possibility that their immediate goal is to advance west of the Kherovets River, exactly what I've been talking about the last few days, but although that's pretty obvious, I would have thought. Um, and then the last point, overall, uh, and this is the idea, that, that, okay, if they do find a weakness, do they have 
the capacity to exploit that weakness. Overall, the current operational picture suggests that Russian forces are being given orders to advance in most sectors, but that they have not massed sufficient of offensive combat power on any one axis to achieve a decisive effect. Exactly what I've been saying. Uh, and I pointed out five different places on the map where they seem to be uh, attacking at the moment. But you've got to remember that the, the Ukrainians will have um, real-time NATO and US intelligence, satellite imagery, and so on and so forth. They know where the Russian forces are. And I was saying yesterday that modern warfare, the kind of uh, deep battle doctrine is is easier, or any kind of doctrine like that in, in warfare, is easier in times gone past, like World War II, when you, you don't really know where all troops are amassing. Yeah, you may have a bit, a bit of airplane reconnaissance or whatever now we've got satellite imagery right and you can tell where people are it's just nothing is a secret and it, it, it so where a couple of weeks ago the ukrainians are saying right russians are 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 looking at a huge offensive uh in the next few weeks and then they downgraded that this week to say they don't appear to be doing a huge offensive because they don't have the capacity to do a huge offensive uh, and looking at the satellite imagery, I would imagine you, you will find that there just isn't the amassing of troops to fit in line with the fact with the claim that Russia are doing a huge offensive. So, are they doing these offensives in a completely underwhelming manner, and they have nothing else to throw at the problem apart from as these mobilized troops can be sent to the front line, shoving them in? So, there's constant but but low level reinforcements being thrown in of low quality. But that's not an amassing of a super awesome offensive shock like front that can that can smash through an exploited gap. So yeah, that that's where we're at. And again, you know, the UK intelligence seemed to be um, sort of reaffirming things that I was claiming yesterday and the day before. But you know, the the any analysts have been saying um, I'm not really bigging myself up because um, at the end of the day, all I'm doing is reading the stuff like this. Uh, so. A, pi a pipeline has exploded. Lots of evidence, it seems, yesterday of Russia on fire. I say lots, like three, it looks like, at least. Uh, one is a big pipeline. And, of course, pipelines getting taken out, as we know from Nord Stream, although Nord Stream was non-operational at the time, uh, is a logistical nightmare because they're, they're not going to be particularly easy to fix, I wouldn't have thought, uh, quickly. And straight away, that's taken out, um, you know, hydrocarbon supply so it looks as though an important gas pipeline in russia has exploded this is reported to be a reserve line for the main pipeline in yaroslav uh, a real uptick in unexplained fires in recent days this is becoming very interesting exactly uh, exactly what i feel as well um and we have yes as well fire near scientific research institute of precision instruments radio electronic and software products for the space sector last night uh this is the, the you know this is big big fire in in pretty much central moscow or near to it you know right in the depths of moscow there um and it's yeah that's that's not not good news and uh another one i believe in coincidence another mysterious russia on fire chapter in krasnoyarsk krasnoyarsk in siberia this time the Savico company goes up in flames Savico is involved in the cargo transportation and warehouse leasing across russia it looks distinctly suspicious to me uh, and I, I guess this is that same one that we just saw, just from different angles. A large fire is underway in the territory of a car service. Oh, actually, it might not be. Car service center located in uh, the Dekabristov uh, Street in the northern part of the city of Moscow. It might well be the same one we just saw. It might not. I don't know. Uh, but just more Russia on fire. Becoming quite a, a, a problem for Russia. Uh, okay, 105 Ukrainian soldiers have arrived in Poland to master Leopard 2 tanks. Um, head of the training group or the training ground of the 10th Armoured Brigade said that this to reporters at the training ground uh, writes you can form. And in fact, so this guy was speaking to reporters saying that, that yeah, we like Leopard 2s very much. They're very good. All my guys have come off the front front line. It was This is an interesting little interview. Uh, said they all come off the front line in Donbass. We were all fighting and then we were given like no notice basically and then we were pulled to come and train on a leopard tank. So I've been wondering whether they are training like complete newbies or people that have just been put through like tank training initially and then they've sent them to get this training or whether they get experienced tankers and you know how they're working this out. But it seems like they have pulled at least according to this guy in his troops people from, from the front line. Uh, US can transfer modern combat aircraft to Ukraine. 
if the conflict drags on or give permission for the re-export of F-16 fighters. But the focus still lies on air defense and ammunition, writes the Financial Times, citing the sources, sources in Washington. Interesting. So that's F-16s are still on the table, at least in principle. Uh, there is going to be a new, I think, $10 billion, is it? Or, or a big old US uh, aid package that they're going to try and pass through Congress, I believe, this week. But that will mainly be ammunition and spare parts and stuff like that. So I don't know that it's going to be anything significantly different. Um, and in fact, I think they've said no to ATAC again uh, because it would weaken their own defensive capabilities, the US, even though they're kind of phasing them out. Um, I still don't quite understand that. I mean, to me, that that's uh, that would just be a no-brainer. That's, that's a one thing they need at the moment. Uh, interesting, Bangladesh has joined in sanctions against Russia banning 69 Russian ships from entering its ports, writes BD News. Uh, this means that Russian vessels will not be able to bring in shipments of, or, of imports, stop for refueling, anchor in the sea, or even use sea routes through Bangladeshi waters. That is, you know, significant. This is, stuff like this is very important. I wonder what sweeteners Bangladesh has been given. I doubt that they would have just suddenly said this out of nowhere. Oh, yeah, we're going to do this. Because I don't know that the countries in that area are particularly wanting to... Um, take a position here because it's in their best interest really to remain neutral then they can you know get money off everyone so i i would imagine there's a sweetener there somewhere usa france and brazil so i reported how usa had had at the embassy had had uh, warned u.s citizens not to come to russia and to actually to get out of russia that this is probably indicative of something big happening soon uh, the u.s intelligence obviously thinking Either a big mobilization uh, is, is coming along and there could be forced mobilization of anyone in Russia, including non-Russian citizens. Uh, so that's a worry or it's things are going to go south and they will start hassling or both, you know, hassling uh, US citizens and et cetera, et cetera. Well, now France, Brazil. So Brazil's an interesting one. Uh, because they're part of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa uh, group. Now, Brazil are saying you, all their citizens need to get out. Uh, leave not just Russia, though, Belarus as well. So USA, France and Brazil. UK, UK have said nothing so far, but I think that that is a significant development and one that, you know, we need to watch closely to see you know, what other countries get, get on board and, and why that is that they're suddenly saying that. Fascinating development here, maybe. Uh, so uh, Kimeta has already contracts with the US military. And if Starlink wants to be out of this lucrative market, then so be it. The US Department of Defense has a big purse to enable Kimeta to lower the price by economies of scale. So this is uh, a, a competitor. And of course, this is, uh, this is how the free market works, isn't it? This is how economics works, which is like, Oh right, you, you're having an issue, and and you're you're pulling some of your uh, like coverage in in Ukraine because you don't want that to be used in offensive fashion. Okay, Elon Musk, right? This is all becoming a bit of a problem, and Musk is getting an awful lot of kickback from an awful lot of people at the moment. Uh, and along comes a competitor that says, "You know what he says? He they can't do. Yeah, we can do that. And uh, what's your price?" uh just yeah interesting um or not what's your price what will you pay us um here's our price so starlink competitor touts pentagon partnership and blasts musk uh really interesting sort of uh, posturing within the telecoms industry here uh, starlink competitor calls musk's ukraine actions egregious and commit a, a positioning itself as a better satcom option for the Department of Defense. Uh, I won't go into the details there. I might have a look at that in more depth and do that as a part of an extra, but certainly um, good news for, for Ukraine at the end of the day because uh, Starlink will then have, have, an, have a choice. They either react to that and go, okay, no, we will do that, in which case Ukraine benefits, or they go, no, we are, we are sticking by our guns, and Kimeta comes along saying, oh, well, we can do this. And as long as they can produce something that's comparable to Starlink, I know Starlink's um, encryption and all sorts is, is particularly good. But if, if this company can do the same sort of thing, then Ukraine gains. So Ukraine gains no matter what from the current situation, I would have thought. Okay, 
Dutch F-35s intercept three Russian military aircraft near Poland, according to the Netherlands Defence Ministry. So the two Dutch F-35s were, um, you know, took, took to the skies and intercepted a formation of three Russian military aircraft near Poland and escorted them out, the uh, Dutch Defence Ministry said in a statement on Monday. Oh, there's, you know, I mean, that's not unusual. That happens just in normal years. We, the British Air Force is often escorting Russian planes out of our air airspace uh, and getting annoyed with the Russians. It's what the Russians do. They kind of prod and probe and annoy and try and see how far they can push the envelope. Uh, but the, in a time of war, obviously, there's an added sense of um, threat. Okay, this is Berlusconi, such a grade A plonker. I mean, whoa. Just historically, he's been a grade A plonker. Now he's more of a grade A plonker. So Berlusconi blames Ukraine war on Zelensky and Chase Maloney. Right. Just to let you or remind you, let you know, in Italy, just recently, they had the election and a far right uh, to centre right coalition has been made. Uh, uh, Brothers of Italy, uh, Salvini's party and Berlusconi's party. Um, so Maloney is 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 the president and she is in charge of the brothers of italy party and then berlusconi's sort of center right party is a is a minor um coalition partner but berlusconi is a friend of putin and there was a lot of worry before they came to power or as they were coming to power that actually the the uh, the italian government would be a russian appeaser and would be on on the side of russia but Maloney came out and she's really strong. And actually, Italy has sent a load of stuff and they have been absolutely on the side of Ukraine. And it's kind of surprised everyone because they were not expecting this because Berlusconi and a bunch of the, um, uh, including Salvini, actually, to some degree, but a, a bunch of the people in government have contacts to Russia. Anyway, Berlusconi's just come out this week uh, saying, and remember, he was given last year a crate of vodka by... Um, uh, Putin and sent a letter that you know he, he his dear friend you know Berlusconi said Putin's his dear friend a very sweet letter all this kind of stuff so anyway but this week Berlusconi whose party backs uh, Maloney's right wing coalition government is a long time friend and ally of Russian Vlad, Pre President Vladimir Putin he said the war in Ukraine quote would have never happened had Zelensky quote ceased attacking the two autonomous republics of Donbass. Whew. So Berlusconi is now basically saying the Donbass, like Luhansk and Donetsk, which is not internationally recognized, and every, everyone in the West is saying, yeah, Little Green Men came in 2014 in a legal war, and it's an illegal annexation, and that is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, Berlusconi said, no, they're autonomous republics. Whew. This is, the, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, parts of the country that Russia has illegally annexed. Berlusconi said he judged Zelensky's behaviour, quote, very, very negatively. I mean, he's he's putting it all in line here. He also criticised Maloney for meeting with Zelensky, telling reporter Sunday that he wouldn't have done the same had he been Premier. The comments drew a quick rebuttal Sunday from Maloney's office, which said that, quote, the government's support for Ukraine is solid and unwavering. Her office has said backing for Ukraine was clear in both government policy and parliament votes, which have included weapons deliveries to Ukrainian forces. Zelensky advisor Oleg Nikolenko on Monday slammed Berlusconi's statement saying that, quote, by spreading Russian propaganda, he encourages Russia to continue its crimes against Ukraine and then bears political and moral responsibility. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, the article continues. In his latest remarks, Berlusconi said that US President Joe Biden could help bring an end to the fighting by offering Zelensky trillions of dollars in rebuilding funds, similar to the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe after World War II. Quote, only something like that will convince this gentleman to agree to a ceasefire, Berlusconi said after casting his vote in a regional election. Right. It's, it, that's all wrong. Berlusconi is a wrong and and uh, uh, that to me is unacceptable. But it shows the division within certain countries um, within Europe in this case. But, you know, these divisions exist in many countries. You can talk about, you know, America and the GOP or not the GOP, certain elements of the GOP, just a few of them just being difficult. Um, I don't think we've seen that. And interestingly, the UK is weirdly very unified behind, even with the opposition, uh, because I think the opposition 
recognize a the moral and political dimensions there, but also they recognize what the public broadly wants. And I, I think trying to drive a, a different direction would be a vote loser in the UK. I think that's very particular to the UK. We've seen that UK has the highest pro-Ukrainian uh, polling. I think one of the highest in the world outside of maybe the the Baltics and um, Poland. Uh, so it, 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 there's a different dimension going on there, but America is a different beast to the UK and Italy is a different one as well. And then you have, say, France has people like um, uh, Le Pen, Marine Le Pen, and the connections to Russia and her party being funded and then, you know, the right-wing party being funded by the Russians to some degree over the last few years. So you have all these kind of machinations going on. Well, that kind of funding and fermenting political discord within uh in, within europe or within certain countries we have the problems going on in kosovo uh, and serbia so where is kosovo just to let you guys know if you're not aware we have the balkan states here so the north of greece you've got north macedonia you've got serbia croatia uh slovenia hungary uh, and part of serbia is kosovo which is uh rather is it you know it is a difficult area it's not recognized as an independent state by serbia but it you've got a you've got a nato force there and it's all it's left over from you know the 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 wars that have been going on over the past decades and whatnot anyway that's butchering a whole load of very complex geopolitical uh, stuff going on well Mercenaries, so this is a Daily Telegraph, Wagner were mercenaries helping Serbia prepare potential attack on our nation, says the Kosovan president. Uh, mercenaries from Russia's notorious Wagner group are working with Serbian paramilitaries to smuggle weapons uh, and unmarked military uniforms into Kosovo, the country's president warned on Friday. The secret operation is designed to lay the groundwork for a potential hybrid attack, attack by Serbia to grab Kosovan territory, uh, Vyosa Osmani claimed in an interview with the Telegraph. The alleged... Uh, preparations by Serbia bear parallels to Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, when Russian soldiers wearing uniforms stripped of any insignia dubbed Little Green Men prepared the way for the peninsula's succession from Moscow. Quote, they bring in weapons and uniforms, but they are not formally part of the Serbian army. Serbia want, wants to achieve its aims without it being called a military operation. Zosmani told the Telegraph in the presidential office in Pristina, Kosovo's capital. The Serb objective is to, quote, prepare solution, situation sorry, for a possible annexation, not through a traditional military operation, but through a hybrid sort of attack. And then later on, the article continues, their intentions were clearly aggressive, she said. They build trenches and military-style barricades, the kind they could use to fight. So what's happened over the last few weeks or few months is that there have been issues within Kosovo. So Kosovo announced that you can't use your Serb driving license or you need to get rid of your Serb driving license if you're living in, in Kosovo and have a Kosovan license. And there are loads of uh, ethnic Serbs living in a northern area of Kosovo that got really angry with this, fomented arguably by Russian um, sh shenanigans and stick poking. Uh, and you had growing tensions you've had growing tensions in this area of kosovo uh and uh, so sorry just to to continue this quote um let's go back actually uh so this is what uh, osmani said the intention is precisely the same as the one used by putin in crimea nine years ago she claimed if you look at what putin did in 2014 it's a complete copycat it's the same playbook initially it, it, he instrumentalized russians who lived there then he was creating all kinds of false flag operations and then he sent in these paramilitary groups. There is clear evidence with that Serb paramilitary groups have been planning and organising this with Wagner. Uh, who, how many were at the border in or inside Kosovo territory? That's an issue that is still being investigated. Their intentions were clearly aggressive, she said. They build trenches and military-style barricades, the kind they could use to fight. Serbia has denied that mercenaries from the Wagner group may have had any role in the standoff with Kosovo. Many Balkan experts are sceptical that Serbia would dare try to annex northern Kosovo because it would bring them into a confrontation with a NATO-led K4, KFOR or Kosovo force, uh, which includes American and British soldiers. Uh, quote, for as long as uh, KFOR is based in Kosovo, I don't think Serbia will take military action, said Helena Ivanov, a Belgrade-based Balkans expert with the Henry Jackson Society think tank. 
Uh, Serbia is not going to enter a war with NATO. It did it once and it lost. It's not going to do it again. K4's presence is a deterrent for both sides, not to over-escalate. So there you go. That's today's news. Uh, lots to cogitate on. Sorry, it's another long one, but just so much goes on every single day. It's, it's nuts. Anyway, uh, thanks so much. Please like, subscribe and share. Take care and I'll get back to you with a frontline update later.